who's wrong and who's wronger. In this corner, followed by Millions James, the exploding unicorn breakaway. And in that corner, ignored by millions, Steve Dosh, Rinko Levers. Hey, everybody. It is another day in the sun with Wrong and Wronger. And I am Steve, Dr. Steve putting on the Ritz Olivas. And he is James Taco Breakwell. And Breakwell, I just looked at your e-newsletter this week, and it occurs to me that just given that you had your 15 year reunion, you're not even old enough to get the reference of why putting on the Ritz and Taco is even funny. That uh, th- that was popular way, way after your era. That was, uh, that, those are like on those those classic MTV countdowns back when MTV was still a thing. Yeah, I, I know all about classic. those. Classic? Yeah. yeah. Wow, all right. <laughs> it's that old, it's gone through multiple life cycles already, but it's, it's in there, I get your references. I don't approve, but I get them. So we'll just keep going. <laughs> But 15 years out of high school, your listeners and your Twitter people are looking at that going, damn, this guy's old. And mine are looking at that going, I got bottles of shampoo older than Breakwell. <laughs> but how, how, how did that feel to be 15 out of high school? Just give me a little taste of youth gone wild. Well, oh, you mean like what I did there? Well, I had, I must have. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I, I feel old every day. I mean, I, I spend my time with kids, you know, eight, six, four, and two. To them, I am ancient. They can't even <laughs> fathom somebody in their 30s. But I saw, let me tell you when I really felt old. I saw a picture of yeah. my dad the other day with me when I was seven. And he was younger than I am now. And then it hit me. <laughs> you see those milestones like, man, I thought he was old back then. I'm, I'm older than that. And then I, you know, sat down in a chair and had a nap because that was that was enough for that day. (laughs) Yeah. So you knew your dad when he was your age. Yeah, yeah, because I. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, because he had me. I was uh, he was twenty two when I was born, so I was I was the oldest child. So my parents were young. My dad was twenty two and my mom was nineteen. It was crazy. Holy cow! Yeah. Boys and fathers, though, it's an interesting, there is a year where the two streams cross, and for you, I guess it was, you were 13 when your dad was 35, and so you knew your dad when he was even younger than you are now, but do you remember when you were in eighth grade how you looked at your dad? Yeah, I remember him as just being impossible, not not, not like ancient, but like in that adult age range that I would never attain. And now I'm just like blown past that. I know. And I just look back, I'm like, oh my gosh, I ruined your life. You spent all of those years raising us. (laughs) Oh, there's a little bit of guilt there. And now your life is being ruined. My dad was also 22, oh, really? so when I was 13, he was 35, and I, I remember when I was in middle school just thinking, man, adults, they know what they're doing, yeah. they all do their job exactly the way it needs to be done, like they know everything, and it's uh, then you turn 35 and you realize yeah. no one has any idea what they're doing, that, and the whole world is going isn't sideways. Isn't that scary? Our lives were in their hands, and they didn't know what they were doing either. <laughs> they were just winging it. We all just believed it. We're like, oh, you've got this. Like man, it's a miracle any of us live to adulthood. We've uh, we parents, we are good at putting on the facade and lying to our children. We are good at faking competence, but at some point they'll realize we were we were just flying by the seat of our pants. So thank you, mom and dad, for not uh, not getting us all killed. I do appreciate you helping me survive my childhood. Well, there you go, and that's what mothers are for. It's uh, to make sure dads don't kill the children. Yes. <laughs> Well, speaking of killing children, I have no transition for this, James. I'm out of segues here, so. (laughs) Well, I think we've hit rock bottom in the segue department. (laughs) (laughs) This is the podcast where we don't kill children. Instead, I tried to pull that out of the fire and burn my fingers. But this is the podcast where we argue about topics that nobody argues about, but everyone wants to throat punch somebody else over. And James, today's topic... It's like comparing two things that aren't even related. What are we going to talk about today? We are going to do something that probably should have been our first episode and every episode thereafter. We are going to compare (laughs) apples and oranges. Which is better? Apples and oranges. They say you can't do it, but we're going to do it right now. We are going to do it, and we are dressed to the nines while we do. James, you can't see. Even though I'm not wearing pants, I'm wearing spats. 
So you do the math on that one. I gotta say, he was so proud James, of his outfit you, that, he, right. that he texted me a picture of it beforehand. This is our interaction. There's, <laughs> there's zero conferencing that goes on before this. The only lead up to this is a picture of his face wearing that stupid hat. That's all I get. That's how I get burned. And it's a miracle I still answer the phone when he calls. I just part of me just, just thought about blocking the number. So you just you keep, just a little. Uh, <laughs> To pull the curtain back a little, the first words out of Breakwell's mouth are, are you really wearing that hat? <laughs> <laughs> and the answer was no, man. Why would any human being wear this to do a podcast? That's absurd. <laughs> There's no way. Oh. Anyway, apples to oranges, and uh, the now no longer young James Breakwell will tell me which two sides the coins will represent for him in this debate. All right, well, heads up are apples for me, and tails up are oranges for me. We have the Guam quarter of fate. Right. Apples is heads, it is up, it is down, and it is Guam this week. You had a run of heads, one Guam, but now you got a second. You, sir, have oranges. Excellent. And first, though, I would like to compliment you since you forgot. And my compliment yeah. oh, to you. Oh, we forgot the compliments. <laughs> my compliment to you is to get that you continue to do this podcast despite being old and senile. Even though I have to remind you of all the parts you what? forget. You're still here. You're still going. That's gumption, which is an old-timey word you use all the time. So I, I do. Ooh, yeah, that's true. I do. I do appreciate use gumption. Yeah, you. You are going to be the spryest man in your nursing home. I, I'm confident of that. So congratulations I, I, I'm to the you. Bees knees, man. <laughs> ah, twenty-two skidoo to you as well. Let's drop another two bits into the Nickelodeon and just cut a rug, you and I. You could be the cat's pajamas. I, well, James, <laughs> I realize you have no idea what I'm talking I, about I'm not right even now. You just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I could. That's the sad part about this segment of the podcast. But I want to compliment you on your maintaining your party animal card because I read your e-newsletter, as you know I do every week. <laughs> I actually pour over it. I read it a couple of times, <laughs> mostly just to look for typos. Of course. Because <laughs> I know you love when people do that to yes, you. Yes, absolutely. But the description of your night on that, that kid-free 15th anniversary, just me and the wife painting the town red, that's another phrase you don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> But what did you have, like a beer and a half, and you had to drop a couple alka salts or take a Dones pill and then go lay down for the night? What you, Your party animal status probably hasn't changed much since college, but I'm guessing it's declined not as far as mine, though. I'm usually in bed by 8 o'clock. Yeah, I, uh, well, what the, we actually succeeded at bar hopping. For the first time ever, we made it from one bar to a second bar, so I was pretty proud of myself. <laughs> and having done that, I don't know what the purpose was. You get to the new bar, and they had pretty much the same beers as the old bar at the same prices and it was the same people we brought the same crap with us but you know what we were we were getting slightly tipsy at a new location and i guess that's where it's at so you know I, it only took me till i was 33 to achieve my that milestone so i'm proud of myself <laughs> my wife is not so proud of me but I'll, I'll be proud enough for both of us uh so yeah i'm i'm, I'm a wild guy and that, and that mind you was way wilder than our regular date nights where we put on an 80s movie which to us is ancient and then we get drunk on the couch watching what? that so let's that's that's how we usually get wild. So this going out and getting drunk in public was a step beyond that. So we're we're out of control. You know, uh, three things. One, you mentioned in an earlier e-newsletter that date night for you is playing Xbox on separate consoles in separate rooms, and I thought the romance has not died in the Breakwell house. <laughs> Number two, I'm old and senile to the point that I confabulated 1985 your birth year with 35 your age. You're not 35. You're 33. Yes. <laughs> and three. You bringing up bar hopping, it makes me think, that's true. What the hell are we doing when we bar hop? Don't you just want to sit and get drunk? Yeah, I, the first, it was amazing. So I was drinking in my hometown for the first time ever. Like, I missed that whole stage of my life because I was away at college. And <laughs> unlike many of my classmates, I didn't who, who will never listen to this podcast, so it's okay. But I, I didn't have that crash and burn phase where I was at home for a few months or a few years. Like, I moved straight out of college to start my terrible newspaper job. But that terrible newspaper job could pay for an apartment in a different town so i never hit the bars your of my terrible town. apartment yeah my terrible apartment so i actually went there and like draft beers were 250 on a saturday night i was kind of blown away i, I two drinks for five bucks it was a, it was exactly my price point so it was I, I was a good fit for that lame bar we were meant for each other 
Uh, we define the term lightweight. That's cool. <laughs> All right. Well, now that we have sufficiently complimented each other and questioned the age, I'm going to ask for a birth certificate later to prove that you're actually younger than I thought you were when I said I have bottles of shampoo older than you. But uh, you, sir, have oranges and we're almost out of time. So hurry up. OK, well, I can make this argument really quick. For most of American or uh, American history, oranges have been an incredible treat. They were so amazing you could give them as Christmas presents back before we had refrigeration and you know integrated you know shipping of food from around the world. And orange was the height of delicacy. And if you if you read an old children's book, they still talk about getting an orange for Christmas and how incredible it is. Nobody gets an apple for Christmas. An apple is just a garbage food that's everywhere. An apple is what my pig eats what? out there. What? I have two apple trees in my backyard. I, I already did a video rant about this. I didn't get any of them. They all a squirrel knocked them off the tree. The dog ate them. The pig ate them. The squirrel <laughs> ate them. They were all gone. I didn't get any apples. You know what? My life wasn't that much worse off without them because I have bags upon bags of oranges shipped in from around the world. And why are apples oh worth flying God. in? Because or why are oranges worth flying in? Because they're incredible. Because they give you citrus. Because they prevent scurvy. Because they are a great ingredient in Jello. I mean, I could go on. Oranges are great. Apples have nothing on them. Uh, first of all, you love your pig, and so anything your pig eats, you've got to figure is ambrosia. It's the food of the gods. But even that notwithstanding, I, oranges were Christmas presents before Christmas presents were invented, and people started giving each other real gifts, like fruit cakes that just keep going around in circles. And uh, also, oranges were popular when people had monocles and pocket watches and they asked what time the train will be arriving and they wear vests and they put their hands in the front pockets of those vests so that they don't have to touch their top hat all the time. Like uh, you're talking about the days of your James Breakwell. I'm talking about the days of mine, which is right now. I don't live in the past watching The Breakfast Club and uh, Short Circuit and War Games on a Friday night with my wife. We go watch Infinity War and we eat apples. Oh. You know why? Because <laughs> an apple a day <laughs> Let's go the liar card right here. You're sitting in the movie theater <laughs> crunching an apple. Is that what you're telling me? Well, we we drink homemade apple teenies. That's probably about the same thing, right? <laughs> but an apple a day keeps the doctor away. And if your long-term life goal is to get rid of Olivas, what could be better than that? Well, I, I got to tell you, there's a class of people I didn't even realize there were until the other day. There is something called Whoa. an apple snob. There's no such thing as an orange snob, oh. but there are apple snobs out there. You know how at the grocery store there's 65 varieties of apple, but they all more or less taste uh, no. the same, except there's like the green apples yeah. and then the rest of the apples that are pretty similar. Well, there are apple yeah. snobs out there who will only eat certain kinds of apples and get upset if their artisanal grocery store doesn't <laughs> stock those. I mean, they're very, very <laughs> agitated about it. Oranges are oranges. Like, they just go in the orange bin. And one week they, might, week they might be from Argentina. One week they might be from California. One week they might be from, from Africa. You just never know. But they're just oranges. Oranges are oranges. They taste a little different. Sometimes they're super sweet. Sometimes they're not. But we... The orange eaters are of the people. We don't we don't go and complain about oranges on Twitter. We don't differentiate between breeds. An <laughs> orange is an orange. It's, it's, it's called by its color, and we will eat it. I don't know why you would want to be all hoity-toity with these apple snobs. I mean, have you ever gone to an apple orchard where they have it, like, laid out by type? There's, like, 60 types as you walk down the rows. After you spend an hour trying to park and you go and you pay six times more than an apple's worth for the privilege and the experience of picking it yourself, you never took your kid's apple picking? It's, it's, it's the tourist trap of young parents. We've all fallen into it at one time. Let me tell you what's not a tourist trap. Orange picking. That's not a thing. Oh, my they God. Pick them from the, they pick them, they ship them to the store, they put them in the one orange bin, you eat it, and you're done. So I am, I am done with you uh, apple snobs. Orange is the way to go. Uh, first of all, you need to settle down, beer snob, because <laughs> you have that gene in you. It's just a little misdirected. And uh, 
second of all, I have had an orange off the ground on the Arizona State University campus where they have an abundance of orange and grapefruit trees growing all over the place. And if you don't treat those oranges right and get them fertilized at the right time, they are as sour and bitter and disgusting as you can imagine. <laughs> that fruit doesn't ripen up right unless you go through this whole process. I don't know if there is an organic orange. It's all GMO-driven Monsanto oranges. You, sir, have apples fit for a pig. And that, to me, says all we need to know about how wholesome apples are. And really, apples are the main ingredient of apple pie, so much so that the word is actually in the title, and there ain't nothing better than a slab of apple pie. And if you disagree with that, James Breakwell, you are not an American. I am so American that I believe in choice in my foods. That's why my profile pic on Twitter for years when I went viral was a picture of me with a giant <laughs> plate of orange jello yep. full of orange slices. Yep. It defined my internet career. Those oranges, they made me. Without that orange jello, I would have been nothing. People would have just kept scrolling Can by. Can you give me... If I, if I would have been... Give, give me 30 seconds. What's the backstory of that picture? Oh, oh, so uh, it was from a Reader's Digest article. It's going to take more than 30 seconds. Um, oh, sorry. I, I wrote, I just, I, I've always wondered. Okay, I, uh, I wrote a blog post back in the day when I wasn't very big on Twitter, but I, I wrote a blog post about how my grandma had made me orange jello one time. It was it was pretty good. It was orange jello with oranges mixed in, mandarin oranges. And I ate it, and I said, this is pretty good, Grandma. And she took that to mean this is your favorite food in the world. So the next time, <laughs> she made more. And she's like, this is just for you. So obviously, I have to eat it all. And so I ate it all and so she made me even more the next thing like I was caught in an orange jello feedback loop but it is good but it's not like on the pantheon of my favorite foods so I wrote a, a blog post about this and Reader's Digest picked this up and uh, they're like well we need some nice. art to go with it so they flew two photographers from New York to my town oh my and god they, and they for three hours they took pictures of me eating this jello it was incredible actually and they didn't even trust me to like make the jello they hired a local baker for it the local baker brought the food over and like they knocked on my door like i was some kind of celebrity the local baker was there like are you are you the guy and i was like yes i am the guy who eats jello and then what do you what do you, what do, you do for a photo, photo shoot for three hours eating jello it's like okay look look amused by the jello look angry at the jello look confused by the jello and that and that quizzical confused expression of the jello with my eyebrow raised that was what became my profile picture for years and i've just imitated that pose ever since and here's a little behind the scenes info my jello size was inadequate. It was actually photoshopped. The real jello was definitely <laughs> oh my God. one tier. And after the fact, they beefed up my jello to be more impressive. <laughs> you just see, you know, when you and you still see that picture sometimes when people have old screen caps to my tweets. It has been artificially enhanced, and I'm not ashamed to admit that. I'm man enough wow. to, to admit it. Dude, you do not disappoint. That was freaking <laughs> awesome. Thanks for that. I'm glad I asked. And that's why Orange And everyone Orange who knows you <laughs> That's everyone who knows you knows that picture, but have you ever told that story on a show or anything? In an interview? Uh, I've I've told it in writing. I don't know if I've told it in a show. I didn't I didn't start talking a lot on on, on podcasts till I, I teamed up with you and that's when everybody <laughs> stopped listening. So probably nobody's heard it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, seven people have heard it, and they have to vote. So tell them what number they have to use to vote for Steve this week. All right. If you want to vote for James Breakwell and his amazing oranges that made his career, vote for 38. <laughs> if you want to vote for snobbish Steve and his artisanal, oh. artisanal ooh, apples, ooh. 26. Nice. And if you want to throw your Good vote away with a random, it is 35. By the way... Um, <sighs> And that wasn't yeah. okay. By the way, we didn't specify who won last week. Now there's no penalty videos. I know people people feel we don't feel enough shame, but Steve did get thoroughly Ooh. thwacked last week by five percent. Five percent he lost by That's a huge margin of error. Okay. So when seventy one percent of people actually over seventy one percent because there were two garbage options, probably closer to eighty percent of people vote for a fake option. When you lose that remaining yeah. sliver by five percent that's a that's a landslide. That's that's like the Walter Mondale losing the it presidential is. election scale. I mean, you were you were destroyed. <laughs> that was Geraldine Ferraro that lost it for. And him. that's why. And that's why when I when I saw that picture, I asked him, "Is that your hat of shame? Is this what you're wearing because you you lost?" But no, he, he's wearing that hat because he just has bad taste. So take that for what it's what? worth. 
Let's let's keep Steve in bad hats, and we'll just assume they're always his penalty hats. Vote for me this week. Oranges are better. We all know it. Uh, vote for me because I'm like a ray of sunshine. This is my sun hat, and I'm wearing a bright yellow sunny shirt today. It's just sad, Steve. You're yeah. you you are bringing me all down. Right, You're well. raining on my parade it's with your dress. <laughs> That moment of silence was brought to you by a flummoxed Breakwell. <laughs> you can flummox Breakwell too just by voting for Steve. So hit that 26. That was Steve Sullivan on the Predators number. Anyway, until next week, this is Steve Olivas, Dr. Steve, speaking for James the flummoxed Unicorn Breakwell. Thank God, I wish that would have been a little smoother, James. But. Thank you for listening and thank you for watching. And remember, two wrongs can make a right.